looks metal. Um, before I start this video, a few disclaimers because it is a special video. This is the first video where we do a collab. Um, we do a collab with a YouTube channel called Smallest of the Small. Um, the girl who runs it, she's a lovely girl. I personally know her from high school. Go show her some love. I'm going to leave her channel link down below. She does a lot of vlogs if you like that kind of thing. Then you're going to be happy with her content that she provides. Also, if you hear birds chirping, um, I can't control that. I practically live near a forest. So, throughout this creepy, scary-ass video, you're going to hear birds chirping. I'm just going to deal with it. Um, today's video is about the unsolved murder case of the Black Dahlia. She was murdered and her murderer has not been caught, though people have... Um, there are suspects that were named in the case, and a big one was called George Hodel, but we'll get into the suspects later. Um, in order for me to explain the sequence of events before her murder and after the murder, I'm obviously going to have to show a picture of the crime scene. Her body does have a blanket covering it and I'm not going to show her face after she was found murdered because it's really disturbing. It, it's just stuff out of nightmares. Now this murder happened in 1947 and she died at age 22. She was born in 1924, the 29th of July. Um, she wanted to be an actress but she did work as a waitress. Before we get into the crime scene of her death, sadly, um, I'm going to talk about the nickname that she claimed. She called herself the Black Dahlia after seeing a movie that came out a year before her death called The Blue Dahlia. Now, I'm going to read you the summary of what it's about and just listen to... Just listen, because in my eyes, from doing, what, six days of research, I find that there's similarities between the events that happened in the movie and the events that happened in real life. So I'm going to read the movie summary. It is called The Blue Dahlia and if you're wondering why would she claim a nickname The Black Dahlia, that was because she wore a lot of black clothes, she was known for wearing sheer black clothes and she also liked that movie very much so that's why she claimed the name. The Blue Dahlia is about a naval officer who went to fight in the South Pacific. Once he returns home in Hollywood to see his wife Helen, he finds out that she's been having an affair with a local nightclub owner. Now, this obviously makes him very upset, but at that time when he arrived to see his wife Helen, Helen's lover, the nightclub owner, broke, broke off the relationship and shortly after this, Helen is found murdered. She is dead and everyone seems to have a motive. If that doesn't sound like the Black Dahlia case, I don't know what does because that's very fucking specific in regards to surrounding her death. Worthy to note that this film was an American crime film. Um, now I'm going to speak about the meaning or the symbolisation of the word Dahlia. Now it is a flower and before I get into any details, you're probably questioning why are you defining words? Why am I defining words? Because it gives me an idea as to the killer's motives, like why he did it and what kind of individual he is. I'm going to explain, read out the definition and I'm going to read it twice, so listen. Dahlia is a flower. Now, there are different colours. It can be a black flower, meaning black dahlia, pink, range of purple, different colours. Actual flower itself symbolises inner strength, dignity, elegance, inner strength and creativity. This murder was very fecking creative. I will give the killer that. So, um... It's most likely, by the way, that the killer is dead now, but, like, I'm going to read it again. The flower symbolises grace, elegance, creativity, and inner strength and dignity. All of those things were clearly stripped away from her just by seeing the fucking crime scene. Now we're going to go into the meanings of it. I've read, I've just read there the sim symbolism of the flower. Now we're going to go into the meanings. So it has a different range of meanings from enduring grace to warning signs. The Black Dahlia's death has inspired many books, TV shows and movies. I'm going to get into the crime scene. Um, before I go on, I'm going to say a sensitive to graphic content or pictures of crime scenes. Um, probably skip forward this video, but if you do that, you're not really going to understand the sequence of events or anything about the case. So before I go on to explain the crime scene and how her body was found, um, there are bits in it about the feminine area, about wiping bodies clean, and just what just a warning. So before I go on, I'm going to, if you want to leave the video, I completely understand, but I'm going to be showing the crime scene photo now. Here it is. So on the morning of the 15th of January, Wednesday, 1947, at 10am, a mum and a daughter discovered the body in Liamert Park, if that's how you pronounce it, Liamert Park. And at first, when they noticed it, they thought it was a, um, a mannequin. 
but on further observation they noticed it was a body. The police were called immediately and this was the body was left in a place in a park, public place, where everyone could see it. Amy Park is in California, LA. Now I'm going to be talking about the body. When she was found by the mum and the daughter, they did not know who she was. She was unrecognisable. She had suffered so much types of different abuse and like so much shit. It's they were not able to identify the body. Now, her body had been cut up at the waist, um, full sliced in half, and the weather's graphic. Um, she had an eerie, creepy smell, which had probably been cut with a knife. Had a really exposing, grin smile. Female parts had been shaved, and the body had been wiped clean. She was found naked, and all of the blood from her body had been drained completely. There was no blood found at the crime scene. Also worthy to note that her intestines had been removed and when the autopsy was done um, the police and investigators found out that there had been severe rope marks on her throat um, or I should say neck sorry on her wrists and her ankles that leads investigators and police to believe that she was kidnapped and for a couple of days tortured before her death. They're called ligature marks, if you want to be specific, but they basically resemble um, rope marks. She was she was tied together with some kind of rope, and obviously that's really sad to say, but whoever did this, like, it's just the way she was found and how her body resembled. The police, on further inspection of the body, when it was initially found by the daughter and the mother, when the police arrived at the crime scene, they said that it looked like the body had been posed. Um leading people to believe that she had been sexually assaulted but there, no, there were no signs of intercourse or she had severe deep cuts on the upper arm and the lower left side of the chest near her breast the body had clearly been cut with a technique that was used in the 1930s this technique was called hemicorporectomy that's a long word but that was a technique that was used and used by doctors and surgeons and it was a last resort for those with um, fatal illnesses such as traumas or tumours. She had suffered serious bruising to her skull, the front of her head and her face in particular. This leads me to believe that someone had been punching her repeatedly in the face and head. Um, cause of death was hemorrhaging due to the blows to her head and her face. Also, Elizabeth had a tattoo of a rose on her thigh. I'm not sure which thigh to be exact. This rose tattoo that was on her thigh had been sliced off and inserted up her, you know, lady parts. I'm aware that's very graphic and sick in the head. Like I said before, her female area hairs had been shaved off. The killer didn't take any chances and removed any evidence wiped the body clean, washed it, shaved it, any evidence, he didn't want himself to be known. There was also a B or a 13, um, I'm assuming it was a B, carved on her forehead, right in the middle. On her right hip was a crisscross marking. At the time, detectives and police thought that she had been, like I assumed, that she had been um, tortured and held captive somewhere before her actual death. The police and investigators thought this because of the deep um, rope marks that were found on her neck, ankles and wrists. Um, also, because there was no blood found at the crime scene, um, the detectives and police at the time thought that she had been um, near, right near the end of her death. Um, the killer had left her in a bathtub to drain the blood. I genuinely do believe that the killer used a bathtub because of the just no blood was found at the crime scene, it makes no sense. After she was dead, um, the killer clearly cut her up and placed her at the park, a public setting. Some suggest that her body was cut up for easy transport. To me, it's very evident that the killer was male and knew her. Um, he planned this murder, he wanted it to be public. He was most likely a surgeon or a doctor due to the mutilation that was performed on her body. When it came to identifying the body, she was in such a, she had been through a lot, like so much damage and mutilation that it was difficult to pinpoint who she was, her identity. She had no belongings with her, they were all gone from the crime scene. Um, to identify the victim, um, which was later known to be named Elizabeth, her fingerprints were sent to the FBI for examination to determine who this was. They identified it as Elizabeth Short. Once the police and FBI identified her as Elizabeth Short, her name came up on the police records and she had been arrested for um, underage drinking. 
we're going to talk about what happened before her death. At the time she was getting over a failed relationship with her ex and she did this by going out and like, going to bars and talking to different men, trying to get her mind off of her ex. And she was out getting drunk and like seeing different men at different clubs. This made it difficult for police and everyone around her to pinpoint who exactly she was talking with and who she was being seen with before her death. Um, when she was still alive by the way, a, another murder was connected to her but this happened before her murder. She also had a rich socialite friend or I should say acquaintance of hers who was called Georgia Erdoff, I think I'm pronouncing that right. She was murdered in her home at the bathtub. She was also strangled to death which is very similar to Elizabeth's murder because it's been very highly likely that she was her body was drained in a bathtub and there was uh, strangulation like you know signs of a rope being around her neck so that's those cases are very similar in that aspect of it and um, Georgette was found dead now they have no her death is also unsolved and she died at age 20 on the 12th of October 1944 in West Hollywood California Um, some suspect that Georgette and Elizabeth's killings were done by the same person. Days after Elizabeth's murder, the police started receiving and the LA papers getting taunting letters from the killer himself. Now, whoever the killer was, he clearly enjoyed the attention and the control that he got out of it. The police knew that the letters were ripped by the killer himself because he was referring to things about Elizabeth, specific details about the murder, that no one else could have known. So the first letter was sent to the police in an envelope and in the envelope it was a ransom note. Now if you don't know what a ransom note is, it's fine, I'll explain. A ransom note is basically um, clippings from different magazines, letters that are pasted together on paper and this is known as a ransom note but the note was very fucking taunting and criminal to the police. But the note was drenched in gasoline which is known to remove fingerprints so this was done to hide the killer's identity and the first letter read to LA examiners and other LA papers, here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. Now, once this letter was handed to police and other newspapers or whatever, along with the letter, the police found um, Elizabeth's birth certificate, some of her photos, her social security card, and also, most importantly, an old address book with pages missing. What I'm curious about is if there was pages missing from her address book, what pages were missing? The pages in the address book that were missing could have been the killer's identity, someone that she knew. After the first letter, the police received a ha new handwritten letter by the killer. The second letter said, here it is. Turning in Wednesday, January 29th, 10 a.m. Had my fun with police. Black Dahlia Avenger. Now, I'm also going to um, explain the meaning of Avenger. <laughs> Every time I say Avenger, I just go to fucking Marvel. That's, that's just my nerdy ass self. We're getting off topic here. But basically, Avenger means when a person inflicts pain or harm to someone in return for a wrong that has been done to them. So it's similar to revenge. More letters arrived. After that 10 year letter from the killer, no one turned themselves in. My mind he's rich, I don't know why, but he's white male, medium build got physical strength, he's knowledgeable in the surgeon or doctor department and he would have known Elizabeth. Before we go into the suspects, I'm going to show you a picture of a man. Now you're probably thinking, who is that man? Why is he relevant? Um, because this man has never been identified, people. And his photo was found with Dahlia's belongings. I'm going to go through the suspects. Now, the first suspect is called Robert Manley. He was nicknamed Red and he knew Elizabeth and he was the last person to see her. He dropped her off at the Biltmore Hotel in his car. When police questioned um, Robert, he said that he had no sexual relationships with Elizabeth due to the fact that he was married and had kids. But he did admit to having dinner with her at the hotel and then they went upstairs to bed and they slept in separate beds. No offence to Robert but I smell, I smell bullshit. Just saying, he last saw her making phone calls in the hotel lobby. One week before her body was found, Robert returned to San Diego. He passed a polygraph test in 1954. He was also sent to a mental hospital. 
but he remains innocent and is not no longer a suspect in the case. To be honest, um, I think the case is closed now, but no one was ever like arrested or charged for Elizabeth's murder. Second suspect, which is the biggest and known suspect in this whole case. George Hodel. He was a rich physician who focused on non-surgical treatment of patients. That means that he has no, he has nothing to do with surgery of the patients. He had five different wives and 11 different children. So he was like, get around, okay? One of his sons was called Steve and he grew up to be a detective. Now, when the murder of Elizabeth happened, Steve was only age five. George went to medical school and studied surgery. There was a room in George's house when Steve lived there with his dad that no one was able to go into or enter at all. To this day, the family have no idea what that room in George's house was used for. One time Steve found two photographs in one of his dad's old photo albums and they resembled Elizabeth supposedly. Now these um, photos were tested and analysed and there was a 85% chance this was not Elizabeth. But recent studies and analysation of the photos show that there is recent results of this being a 90 to 95 chance is Elizabeth. George's handwriting was very similar to that done by the killer. During the investigation, because he was the main suspect, the police put a listening device in his home. And on the listening device, they heard George in his house say, Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary because she's dead. Prior to the Black Dahlia murder, um, George was also a suspect in the murder of his secretary, Ruth Spaulding. George was also accused of raping his daughter, Tamar. Due to the accusations and being accused of a murder with his secretary, um, I do believe he probably, he probably did murder his secretary, I believe that. Um, what's weird is he was, even though he was accused of raping his own daughter, um, he was acquitted. Um, people believed that he was his ass was covered by police. Steve, um, as an adult, um, he was now a detective. He went back to his childhood home with his sniffer dog. The dog picked up the scent of death in the back garden in the soil. It resulted in positive testing for human remains. Well, shit, George. Why have you got human remains in your fucking garden? He was a definite killer. Like, I'm not saying he killed the Black Dahlia, but he was clearly a murderer. Evident. These positive results of human remains were not linked to Elizabeth, like, at all. A bit of evidence linking the police to cover up for George was the fact that police, in, in a press interview, like, publicly said, I don't know which officer said this, I couldn't find a name, but he's an arsehole, like, end of story. Because he said, and I quote, She was a tramp, a slag, why do you all care? You're a policeman, you can't go around saying, why do you give a shit about someone's death? Should we not be giving a shit? Uh, that was just... I don't know why that stuck to my mind. Like, that's just some insensitive comment that the police officer or policeman, whoever, made. And maybe this police officer was covering up for someone. Maybe the killer. Um, I'm not saying it was George. Just saying. Um, the photos that were found... Um, there was two photos in the photo album, that the photos that were analysed to be a 90 to 95 chance Elizabeth. I'm going to show you a picture of the photos. George Hodel died in San Francisco of age 91 and he died in the year 1999, the year I was born, bitch. That was just a weird coincidence, I have to say. The suspect is a man called Mark Hansen. Now, Mark Hansen took a liking to Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a very pretty woman. He focused his attention on her in January 1947. Mark was a Danish businessman who owned a nightclub and had connections to the mob. Around this time when um, Elizabeth was talking and getting to know Mark, she was very poor, like she barely had anything. Mark offered for her to stay in his house behind the nightclub he owned. He did this a lot with women that were like, had no place to go. He'd give them a place to stay and let them stay in his home with him behind his nightclub. Elizabeth obviously took this opportunity because she probably had nowhere to go. And Elizabeth stayed with Mark in his home for, on two occasions, but Mark eventually threw her out because they got into a heated argument. On one night in particular, um, Mark Hansen went home and on his stairs, he found Elizabeth crying saying i need to get out of here so clearly she was in some kind of trouble 
The next suspect, Leslie Dillon. And during the 9th to the 15th of January, 1947, police could not trace his whereabouts at all, which is really odd because that was around the time that Elizabeth was considered missing. Dillon worked as a bellhop and was an aspiring writer. He had previously been a mortician's assistant. Now, if you don't know what a mortician's assistant is, it's basically someone who works at a morgue or in hospitals, um, preparing bodies for funeral, moving them, like maybe doing autopsy work. So that's already a red flag to me. Uh, Leslie Dillard never confessed to the murder of the Black Dahlia. Instead of confessing, um, he accused his friend called Jeff Connors. P but police actually had no idea who he, who he was. They could not locate Jeff Connors or even get evidence that he was a real person. They were figuring that um, Leslie just made him up. As a writer, um, Leslie had an interest in sadism and sexual psychopaths, which made fucking hobby or interest to have. Detective questioned where Leslie was on the evening of the 10th slash 11th of January. Police got a call from San Francisco of a man saying that they had found Jeff Connors. Jeff Connors was a real person, but his name was not Jeff Connors at all. His real name was Artie Lane and he was maintenance man. He lived in Los Angeles at the time of the murders. He worked as a maintenance man at the Columbia Studios, which was the favorite place for Elizabeth to hang out. There's speculation that Jeff Connors and Artie Lane were the same person, but police have never actually confirmed this theory. I think it's a high possibility it was the same person. Later on, oh, he was wanted by Santa Monica police for robbing a hotel working as a bellhop there. The next suspect is another highly likely one because he was connected to three different murders. He was also connected to the Cleveland Torso murders, which occurred from 1934 to 1938. Suspect is a man called Jack Anderson Wilson, who also went by the name Arnold Smith and he used different alias names. An alcoholic and a petty criminal, he had been in and out of prison his whole life. After he was a suspect in the Cleveland Torso murders, a specialist investigated these murders in 1947 and later marked down any connections that have been connected to the Black Dahlia murder to see if they could find anything, any clues. Jack died on the 4th of February. 1982, he died after falling asleep in his little hotel room and with a cigarette in his hand. That obviously caused a fire and he died. Now, where he was staying was called the Holland Hotel in LA. Also, Jack has been linked to the murder of Georgette Berdoff in 1944. Georgette, before her death, was dating a man who was not identified nor named, but he was described as a tall man with a limp. Jack Anderson you know, Arnold, he had a limp. He walked with a limp, he was very tall and skinny. Maybe this was just a coincidence, I don't know. I do think it's likely that he murdered um, Georgette. A week after Georgette's murder, the Harold Express newspaper reporter named Aggie got a tip of a tall, thin man with a limp walking away from Georgette's house. Her In an LAPD taped interview, Jack told the police details and information um of the black Dahlia murder which obviously the killer would have only known he was being very specific and this led police to believe that he could be the potential murderer people suspect and i also suspect that the murder of the black Dahlia was a two-man job honestly i think it's likely there is a theory that jack was present at the time of elizabeth's murder and maybe this is where he got his information of her death and the murder in the crime scene Jack had also been in the military, so clearly there was a lot of shady shit going on around this time. The next suspect is Patrick S.O. Riley. Now, he struck my attention. Patrick was a medical doctor, flag one. He knew Elizabeth through nightclub owner Mark Hansen. At the time of the murder, Patrick and Mark Hansen were good friends. And Patrick went to Mark's nightclubs frequently. That Patrick had a history of sexually motivated violent crimes. He had been convicted of assault with a deadly weapon for taking his secretary to a motel and sadistically beating her almost to death for no apparent reason. He did not have sex with her. He did not engage in intercourse with her. Um, she survived. This is just a guess. This hasn't been confirmed, but I'm guessing that from what I've read, um, Patrick tied his secretary up, like maybe maybe with like rope to the bed frame or something. Also worth to note that Patrick's chest, also known as the 
pectoral, which is here, had been surgically removed. And investigators found this very suspicious and similar to Elizabeth's body because she had a deep cut on her um, right breast. Also, um, really weird, but Patrick, as a doctor, was also um, married to the daughter of a LAPD captain. He has not officially been linked or ever been linked to the death of the Black Dahlia, but because of his history of violence, he was a suspect in the case. I think that the police should have been investigating him more than George Hodel because he could, he could have potentially done it. It's one of those cases where it's probably going to remain unsolved. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Sorry for the background noises as usual. If you enjoyed this video or true crime series, um, I will do more. Next week I might do serial killers, I don't know. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share my channel if you'd like to. Stay safe. Bye.